And if you'd like to be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, on page 917, if you're using one of the church Bibles. Sometimes the Bible just straight up socks you between the eyes. Um, And to my mind, this morning's passage is one of those occasions. Um, Last week we were looking together at the Lord's Prayer, or as I wanted to call it, the King's Prayer. Um, Such a a famous, well-known, much-loved, comfortable passage, for want of a better phrase. If it were an item of clothing, I think the Lord's Prayer would, for many people, be like a nice cosy winter knit jumper, the sort of thing you're going to be pulling out of your wardrobes in the next few days. Familiar, reliable. And then immediately afterwards, by way of comment on the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says something that I think stops us in our tracks and makes us, well, less comfortable. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. That is our text for today. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And sometimes the Bible just straight up socks you between the eyes. And says something that we probably rather it didn't. So let me pray and ask that God might help us. Heavenly Father, help us to understand uh, what Jesus is saying in these verses and help us to put it into practice. And please help us, especially where that is um, where that is difficult for us. Please, by your Spirit. Give us soft hearts so that we might be changed more into the likeness of the people you would have us be, more into the likeness of our Lord and Saviour, through whom we have forgiveness. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So just two verses this morning, a very little passage, but a very big topic. Um, Generally, this couple of verses gets covered in connection with the Lord's Prayer. So people preach from verse 5 right through to the end of verse 15, or maybe from verse 9 through to the end of verse 15. They do the Lord's Prayer, and at the end, they sort of throw in a couple of lines on these verses. But I wanted to take a week um, just to look at them in isolation um, and to consider some of the issues and questions that they raise. Um, Because it is such a stark, such a vital But I think such a sometimes very painful and hard subject for us to think about. Forgiveness matters. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the Monty Python film, The Life of Brian. Um, I suspect many of us haven't because it came out in 1979. Um, I don't know how widespread Monty Python is uh, nowadays really. Um, In fact, I suspect there'd be plenty of you in the room this morning who've never even heard of Monty Python. They were a group of comedians who used to make sort of silly sketch shows and, um, and films. And, and the film, The Life of Brian, uh, was a, a comedy which was sort of satirically based on the life of Jesus. I think it was quite controversial at the time, which probably tells you quite how much times have changed, really. And in The Life of Brian, there is a, a scene based on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount. But the scene doesn't focus on Jesus. In fact, Jesus barely appears in the film, and he's always sort of right at the edge of the camera. The the scene focuses on some people in the crowd um, who are there when Jesus is giving them the Sermon on the Mount, but they're they're trying to listen. And these people are right at the back of the crowd, and they're really struggling to hear. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, they mishear it. They say, what did he say? I think he said, blessed are the cheesemakers. What's so special about cheesemakers, they say. And the nearby man says, well, obviously he's not meaning to be taken literally. He's talking about any manufacturer of dairy products and so on and so forth. 
But I wonder if any in the crowd that day, when they heard the words of Jesus, this is not in the life of Brian, this is in the actual event of the Sermon on the Mount, when they heard Jesus say the words of verse 12 of chapter 6, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, I wonder if any of them at that point turned to their mate and said, hold on, did I hear that right? What, what did he just say? Because our two verses today suggest that potentially that is the most surprising, maybe the most unsettling line in the Lord's Prayer. Because Jesus feels the need to clarify. In fact, Jesus feels the need to underline what he's just said. Verses 14 and 15 are Jesus' commentary, if you like, on verse 12. And in terms of what they actually say, well, it's pretty straightforward, I think, because he basically takes what he's just said in verse 12, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, and says it again. Forgive us as we have forgiven others. That's what he says in verse 14. That's the connection. God forgives as you forgive. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And then, in case we're still not totally clear on whether he really means what he's just said, or what that really means, he says it again. Only this time he says it in the negative. If you do not forgive others their sins, verse 15, your Father will not forgive your sins. Three times, Basically, in those four verses, he says the same thing. Um, it's not, I don't think, a particularly difficult thing for us to understand. We forgive others. God forgives us. We don't forgive others. God doesn't forgive us. That's what he's saying. What these verses say is not especially difficult. I don't think. Still with me? Good. Understanding the words is not the problem with these verses, is it? It's understanding what that actually means. What does that mean in terms of our assurance of God's forgiveness when we know how hard we find it to forgive others? What does that mean in terms of salvation by grace? What does that mean in terms of our struggles to forgive others, especially when we have been deeply, deeply wronged, and we still bear the, the scars of that. These verses are pretty easy, I think, to understand, but very, very difficult to know what to do with. And I want us to approach it this way in these next few minutes. Firstly, I want us to think about what forgiveness is and therefore what it means for us to forgive others. And then having thought about that, I want us to think about what it means to say that God's forgiveness is conditional upon our forgiveness of others. And we'll do that by asking the question, if we don't forgive others, what does that reveal about us? Okay, so that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do. So firstly, what is Forgiveness, and tied to that, what does it mean, therefore, for us to forgive others, as Jesus is calling us to do here? So what is forgiveness? Well, this isn't a dictionary definition, but forgiveness is the act of not holding against someone the wrong that they have done, and because you've done that, allowing for that relationship to be restored. So let's just take a trivial example um, to get our heads around it. Let's imagine we're here at Poppin' and Play on a Thursday morning. So there's 20 or so, you know, there's no seats, there's loads of toys everywhere, there's 20 toddlers or um, young children running around all over the place. And let's say that two of them are playing together by the play kitchen. And they both reach at the same time for the blue play kettle. And one, we'll call them toddler A, snatches the kettle away and then proceeds to bop toddler B on the head with it. And much tears. 
and sheep. Now at this point, of course, some grown-ups get involved. And toddler A's grown-up says, no, we don't do that, do we? What do you say? And toddler A says, sorry. And toddler B, toddler B is not having it. They snatch the kettle back and they turn away. That's what it looks like to refuse to forgive. That wrong is going to be held against toddler A. I'm not having the apology and you are not sharing the kettle. But then toddler B's grown up says, now come on, what do we do when somebody says sorry? And toddler B shuffles their feet and says, I forgive you. Actually, they probably don't say that. They probably say, that's okay, or something like that. And then they go back to playing together. That's forgiveness. The act of not holding against somebody the wrong they have done. And in doing that, allowing for that relationship to be restored. Now I want us to notice something about forgiveness that our little kind of pop and play scene reflects. And that is that forgiveness is contingent upon somebody saying sorry. Or, to use the Bible's language, forgiveness is contingent upon repentance. We've already seen repeatedly in Matthew's Gospel the call to repentance. John the Baptist comes in Matthew preaching a gospel of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus comes and calls people to repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. God forgives in response to our repentance. And that same dynamic applies in our relationship with others. Now Jesus doesn't explicitly say that here in Matthew chapter 6, but he does say it elsewhere. Um, so, just for one really clear example, um, in Luke chapter 17, he says, If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. There is no true forgiveness without real repentance. And allied to that, there is no true forgiveness without at least some measure of restored relationship. Now I just want to say that because I think that helps us to see that forgiveness is not something that can happen in isolation. Forgiveness is not, if you like, something that one person can do unilaterally by themselves. Some of you will have people in your lives or will have people in your past friends, family members, and some of you will have people in an ongoing, current way who have wronged you, or who are wronging you now, causing deep pain and trauma. And verses like these, which connect God's forgiveness of us to our forgiveness of others, are therefore extremely hard, and I think can just be very, very unnerving. And in many of those instances, the, the people concerned may not have ever acknowledged the wrong they have done, they may never have said sorry, they may never have sought any kind of reconciliation. Again, to use the Bible's language, they have never repented, they've never sought to make things right. In some cases, they may never do so. It may no longer be possible. Those relationships may be terminally broken. Maybe in ways that are a great sadness to us, and maybe in ways that are a relief. Maybe in ways that are gladly left behind. But we may be left perturbed by Jesus' words here. How am I supposed to forgive someone? who doesn't take responsibility for what they've done, who has never said sorry. 
And I think I would suggest that the Bible's answer is you're not supposed to forgive them. In fact, you can't forgive them. Because there is no forgiveness without repentance. And without some measure of restoration. God doesn't ask more of us than he does himself. So the onus doesn't lie on you where you have been wronged, but on those who have wronged you to own up to that, to, to take the step of reaching out, to acknowledge that and to seek to put it right. There is no forgiveness without repentance. <clears throat> However, of course, Jesus' words here do challenge us that just like God stands ready to forgive. Think about the father in, in the story of the prodigal son, for example, standing at the gate, looking, hoping that his son will repent, that his son will come back and say sorry. Well, so should we be ready. We cannot forgive those who don't seek our forgiveness, but we can always be prepared to do so. To let go. To accept an apology and in some way to move on in reconciliation. Now that's not easy. Often that is a long careful process to get to that point. But let me say that it is possible and it is hopeful. It's not only the right thing but in God's providence it is the best thing for us. To be ready to forgive it is to not allow ourselves to become defined by the pain that others cause us. To not allow bitterness to take root, to to hold these things, if you like, in an open hand, ready and looking for an opportunity to let go and to forgive. It's good for us and of course it is good for others who are in our lives. It's good for our relationships if we are those who are able to show mercy, to forgive, to, to try and find a way forward. Just as when we are those who are in the wrong, we long for others to forgive us. But that, I think, is a bit of what it means for us to forgive others. But the next big question these verses prompt us to ask, I think, is this. If we don't forgive others, that's Jesus' warning here, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If, when we have the opportunity, we don't forgive others, what does that reveal about us? Okay, let me just read the, these verses just to hear the clarity of the call that Jesus is making. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins... Your Father will not forgive your sins. You must forgive others, Jesus says. But that's not just a kind of one-way thing. You must forgive others as those who seek, as, though they, as those who know they desperately need forgiveness ourselves. These verses are not all that Jesus has to say on the matter of forgiveness in Matthew's Gospel. Later in Matthew chapter 18, Peter will come to Jesus with a question. It's a question directly connected to these verses. You sort of wonder if, ever since he sat on the mountain and heard Jesus say, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, and so on, that Peter had been a bit needled by it, a little bit bothered by Jesus' teaching here. Yeah, but... And so he comes to Jesus... And he says, okay, Jesus, I understand that kind of I'm supposed to forgive people, but how many times do I have to forgive someone? And he's got a suggestion for Jesus. 
He says, what about Jesus? I mean, some people are really annoying. Uh, and some people, you know, do stuff repeatedly. What about seven times? We don't have to forgive somebody seven times, Jesus. And Jesus' answer is, you sense, not the answer that Peter was originally after. Because Jesus says, no, Peter. In fact, you ought to forgive somebody up to, to 77 times. In fact, he basically says here, there's no limit, Peter, to how much you ought to forgive. You must always be prepared to forgive. And then he tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. Maybe you know it. A servant who owes a massive debt to the king, but who is then released from it purely by the king's mercy. Let off the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of pounds. The servant goes free. And he bumps into a, a, a mate who owes him about a tenner. <coughs> he says, you owe me. Pay up. If you don't pay up, I will have you thrown in jail. Well, the word of this gets back to the king. And he says, fine, if, if that is your response to somebody who owes you a little bit, even after you have been forgiven, the massive debt that you owe, well, I will call my debt in after all. In fact, the parable ends with Jesus saying this completely in line with our verses this morning. This is the very end of Matthew chapter 18. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It's a simple story, but it packs a powerful punch. Because we all listen to it and we recognise how wrong it is of the unmerciful servant to benefit from such astonishing, generous grace and yet to withhold it from others, even over so much less. The lesson of the story is that one who does not forgive others has clearly failed to truly and properly appreciate the forgiveness that has been given to them. And there is no true repentance without a true recognition of the value of forgiveness. And therefore, those who are truly repentant will be those who want to forgive others. Not those who necessarily find it easy to do so, but who seek, with God's help, to do so. There will be those that Jesus described at the, sermon, the start of the Sermon on the Mount, describing the kind of the values of kingdom people. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Those who know the glorious gospel truth that God does not ask anything of us, that he has not already done beyond measure for us in Jesus. Those who know the truth of verses like uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Those who know that our debt has been cancelled, that we are free from the guilt and stain of our sin, forgiven freely by the gift of grace in Jesus. Those who know that the Jesus who calls on us to forgive others is the king who was so committed to our forgiveness that he suffered the agony of the cross. If we refuse to forgive others, again, not if we struggle to forgive others, but if we choose to reject forgiveness and to embrace bitterness and revenge, then, friends, humbly I would suggest that we need to come again to the cross 
and we need to comprehend there what Christ did for us. The lives of kingdom people are to be a reflection of their king. A reflection, therefore, of God's heart towards us. And God's heart is to be merciful. It is to be gracious. God's desire is to forgive. He stands ready. I pray that we know that more and more deeply. So that as we have been forgiven, so forgiveness might flow out from us to others more and more readily. Let's just take a moment of quiet to reflect and to respond, to come before the Lord in our own hearts. And then I'll pray. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Heavenly Father, we long to be able to and say those words, to pray that prayer with a clear conscience. Thank you that you are the ultimate example of forgiveness. We thank you that though the debt that we owed, or the way that we neglect you, or the way that we mistreat the good gifts that you give to us, or the way that we do not love our neighbour, we don't love one another as we should. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that though that debt is utterly and absolutely unpayable, Jesus has cleared our account. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are so committed to forgiveness that you sent the Son whom you loved to die in our place so that our slate might be wiped clean. Heavenly Father, please assure us of that truth and please change our hearts by it so that we might be always ready to forgive others. Heavenly Father, you know we don't find that easy. We pray for those um, particularly uh, suffering, particularly struggling, Please help us to help one another. Please grow us more and more into the likeness of Christ. For our good, so that our hearts uh, might, uh, might not be burdened by bitterness. For the good of those around us. And for your honour and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing of God's love and mercy in the great old hymn Amazing Grace. Let's stand. <laughs>